Okay, thank you. Well, um, uh, I think this was billed as a, an informal presentation. Uh, let me show you my screen. Okay, can everyone see that? Okay, uh, and this is going to be very informal because that's what I do is very informal. So uh, the, the basic thing, this is about uh, tychography. And tychography is a lensless microscopy technique. Uh, so this is a lensless microscopy technique. Um, and I'll just go straight to the basic issue. If you illuminate an object, I assume everybody can see my, my cursor here. If you illuminate an object with a laser beam, you get this huge diffraction pattern downstream. Now that diffraction pattern uh, contains all the information about the region of the object that was illuminated, but it sure doesn't look the same as, as the object. Uh, and the reason is that, that what you get downstream really isn't an image of the object. It's an image that represents the, the amount of energy in every spatial frequency inside the region of that object. If you take the object and, and decompose it into, into a whole lot of gratings, uh, and let's say let's say the object is a window screen. Then predominantly it's going to have uh, two components. One will be a horizontal grating, and one will be a vertical grating. Downstream, what you'll see is is predominantly two spots that correspond to the pitch or the the spacing between those those lines in the screen in the window screen. Well, anything can be decomposed into its frequency components, its spatial frequency components. So the diffraction pattern is a map of, of the amount of power in each one of those. In the middle, it's the low frequency components, which correspond to lines that are spaced very far apart or large uh, objects with, with no features. And out around the boundaries, that's where all the fine detail is. That's one of the reasons that you need a big lens to get a very detailed image because you need to capture all that fine detail information downstream and then squish it all back together and rearrange it to form an image downstream of there. The, the lens has to be big enough to catch all that information that gets diffracted around. Otherwise, you only get the low frequency components to form your image from. Uh, let's see. All right, so I'm going to go to something else here. Oops, that's not the right one. So I'm going to go in here. Here we go. Enlarge this a bit. Okay, so this will be a little repetitive, I apologize, but uh, ty tychography is a lensless method of microscopy. You, you get an image without using any lenses at all, at least downstream from the object. So normally what you'll do is you'll scan an object with a laser beam in overlapping spots. At each spot location, the intensity distribution in the far field diffraction pattern is recorded. In other words, going back here to this image, you simply put uh, the sensor from a camera here. You don't, you don't need to take a picture of this. You just put the camera sensor right there, capture all this stuff. The actual scale, this might be, you know, anything from a centimeter to a foot, what, whatever, distance you have to go to capture all the all the important information that's there and then the let's see I think it have it I have it right here so here's another image I grabbed these off Wikipedia 
Uh, this image, it's the same as the one before. It has the same object here. It has a diffraction pattern, but this shows three overlapping spots. Those, those represent the beginning of a series of different spots where you're scanning this laser beam spot by spot across your object. Every time you stop at one of those spots, you capture the diffraction pattern downstream. Now you've got a lot of information, but, but somehow or other, you want to reconstruct an object from that. The, the uh, process for doing that is related to something called phase retrieval. And the idea behind phase retrieval is, is that you've got, I'm going to pull this and back up. Sorry for flashing all these images, but let's go back to this one. This diffraction pattern down here is actually the Fourier transform of this portion of the object. And you'd think, well, you just apply an inverse Fourier transform and you get the object back. And yeah, you could do that if you knew what this really is, but you don't. All you know about this diffraction pattern is how bright it is at every point. You don't know its phase. Here you've got a laser beam. It's nice and clean. It illuminates this object that's got both the thickness and, and, and absorption at each point. The, the absorption decreases the amount of light that's emitted from this point on the object or scattered from that point on the, on the object, but the thickness alters the phase of that light. And light actually is a complex quantity. The, to fully describe light, you need, at each point, you need two numbers, the phase and the amplitude. So this diffraction pattern down here that you record is really a measure of the amplitude of the Fourier transform. All the phase is gone. And in fact, it's not even the amplitude, it's the, it's the square of the amplitude. Uh, you can take the square root and get the absolute value of the amplitude back, but you don't even get its sign. You don't know if it started out positive or negative. So to, in, to invert this sort of classically was considered impossible, that there just wasn't enough information here. However, uh, a couple of decades back, uh, a fellow named Finup, uh, who's still around, came up with a wonderful method for what's called phase retrieval. He can actually reconstruct this object and its phase from its Fourier transform. Now, the way that's done, uh, let me just pause here and, and ask if anyone has any questions yet. Uh, actually, not necessarily. The way I described it here, it is two-dimensional, but, but uh, there's a way to deal with three-dimensional objects, too. You have to do more than just scan in an XY pattern across this. You also need to tilt the object or bring the laser beam in from different directions. Okay. All right, let's go on to... The next thing, which should be in here. Oh, let's see. Sorry, I'm gonna have to find it over here. All right, this is a very sparse description of, of how you get the object back from its Fourier transform. Over here, this red, red thing, we'll say that's the object. Now, we don't know anything about the object right now, but we can sort of take a guess. We have some idea how big it is. So we can, we can take a totally random, uh, 
two-dimensional distribution of bright, dark, and phase, and then just trim off everything that we know is outside that object. We just get rid of that. So what we're doing here is there's this term that took me a while to figure out what it meant, but it's called the measure of the object. And it's just kind of the, the smallest window you can put around the object. Now, so here we've got a random guess trimmed down a little bit by this constraint, <coughs> which is the size of the object. And we apply the Fourier transform to that. Now that'll give us the Fourier transform of our initial guess. It won't look at all like the diffraction pattern we know is right. So we can apply another constraint there. Now we know what the amplitude of this Fourier transform is. So we can just plug that in as the amplitude part. The phase part, we don't know what that is, but we took a first guess over here at what the object was and it gave us both a phase and an amplitude here. So we take the known amplitude and the kind of guess at the phase, which came through this forward transform. And now we have something we can send back here and see how well it matches the object. If it matches the object exactly, then we have the right answer, but it won't. So we come back here and we have sort of a, a guess with two constraints applied at what the object is, except it's not going to fit inside this, this window anymore. So we get rid of everything outside the window, and now we've got a new guess. We just take what landed here, we trim off everything we know isn't really part of the object, and we send it down here again. And you go round and round and round and round, and eventually you find something that meets both of these constraints and then you cannot make any further progress with this. But typically, you end up with a really good solution to what the object really is. Now, any questions at this point? I, th I, I think it's, I'll have to look it up to get the spelling right. F-I-N-E-U-P. Uh, and then there are a bunch of other people that are, that uh, were doing similar work back when he was doing that. Uh, and there are a number of algorithms named after the different people. But <clears throat> what's interesting is they're all basically the same algorithm just with the constraints applied in slightly different ways. Let's see, how do you know what doesn't belong to the image? Okay, uh, in a microscope, you know at least how big the area is that you've scanned. So anything you're going to reconstruct will be no bigger than that. So you can throw away everything bigger than this area that you scanned. Uh, if you are illuminating, let's say we just do this to one piece of an object. So we'll illuminate that one piece with a laser beam, one, one round spot, we'll say. Then, instead of this square box here as the first constraint, we can use that, that uh, circle that surrounds that, that spot that we illuminated. We can use that as this constraint. You don't know that the object fills that spot. It could be something small within that spot, but, but at least you know it's not bigger than that. And that's really all you need to do for this constraint. Dick says, do you have a sequence of consecutive approxima approximations you could show us? Um, I could email you that, but I think it'd be really clumsy to show it to you right now. Uh, I don't have that prepared. I worked uh, most of the last two years on, on some algorithms related to this and, and just made a whole lot of good progress. So 
Okay, let's come back here a little bit further. I got that already. So we'll shrink this again, come back here, and come in right here. Okay, I've kind of described this already. Uh, classically, it's not possible to recover the image from its far field diffraction pattern. Uh, fairly recently means a couple of de decades. Uh, it turns out only a few very natural constraints are required to make the problem solvable. If you know the rough size and shape, that's the measure. And if you know that the object is not absorptive, for example, it can't amplify the light going through it, uh, that it doesn't have any negative uh, brightness, that sort of thing, then those are all useful constraints that you can put in one place or another in that, in that looping algorithm. Okay, so the next thing will be this one. Okay, so here's a little more detailed description of the typical phase retrieval algorithm. Uh, you start here with, with a, an object guess. Now, if you have some idea really what the object looks like, you throw that in. But if you don't have any idea, it doesn't matter very much. You do the Fourier transform to it, that gives you a diffraction pattern based on your guess. You keep the amplitude. You keep the phase from your guess. You do an inverse Fourier transform and go round and round. Each time you do this, you compare the diffraction pattern you get from your guess to the known diffraction pattern. When it's close enough, you say, okay, my object guess must be right. Sounds a little fuzzy, but it's amazingly good. Um, okay, and in, in tychography, each spot in the scan across the object produces a different diffraction pattern. You, d you need to overlap the spots. Uh, now you'd think you might be able to just add all those diffraction patterns uh, to get one diffraction pattern and then you, you go through that looping algorithm to solve for the object. You cannot do that because the diffraction patterns are not complete. They're only the intensity of the Fourier transform and you cannot really get the Fourier transform out of it directly. So, so there's a, a modification of that iterative algorithm, and it goes like this. You spread the calculation out among all the spots. First, you pick the first spot and its diffraction pattern, and you do a small number of iterations of that loop on that spot. That gives you a somewhat refined guess. You take the result of that, you feed that in, to that one little portion where it overlaps with the next spot. So the next spot has a, has a better starting guess than purely random. You go through that with a few, for a few times, then you take what you got from that, you go on to the next spot. You go through all the spots, and now you've got uh, initial fairly refined guesses on all of the spots go back to the front, you go through it all again. You do that multiple times until you find that you've, you've come up with a, a really close approximation to all of the diffraction patterns. At that point, at that point, you just add, you can just add the amplitudes of all those guesses. Uh, you can add the phase and amplitude of all those guesses and and uh, that's, that's the answer. That's what your object is. 
Okay, any questions now? Okay. Okay, I see it. Uh, the, con the constraints seem to be binary masks. Can this be done by optical computing? Um, I don't know of anyone who's actually done it by optical computing, but I've thought about it a bunch, and I think it probably can be. And you're right, the, the measure is a, is a binary mask. Um, the constraints over in the, over in the diffraction pattern domain uh, are actually not so much binary masks. They're more uh, like the amplitude cannot exceed a certain amount um, and that sort of thing. They're somewhat different constraints. But, uh, yeah, I think it can be done by optical computing. As it turns out, with modern computers, this can go pretty fast. So I don't think you need the speed that I would assume you could get from op optical computing. All right, so let's go on down here and talk about the, the factors that can affect the quality of the image produced in tychography. In general, they're the same factors that affect image quality in a microscope. Dirt on the optics of the illumination source. If, if the laser beam has bugs flying through it, you're going to end up with a pretty lousy image. Uh, if the scan stage doesn't position the, the sample, the object, or the laser beam, whichever you're moving, uh, precisely, then, then it gets a lot more difficult to get a good image out of it. Any vibration that blurs the diffraction pattern or or displaces it one way or another, that'll cause problems, uh, just like it will in a high-power microscope. Uh, the dynamic range of the camera is really important. Uh, a typical camera is about uh, 8 bits. If you can get a 16-bit camera, you're, you're going to get a lot cleaner imagery. Camera noise, uh, that relates directly to the, to the dynamic range. If you have an 8-bit camera, then anything in, in further bits just isn't there. It's it's been truncated and and so it's it's like noise. Uh, camera nonlinearities. Um, in my experience, that hasn't been such a big problem. But if you don't, if if the output of the of the camera is nonlinear, so that you double your your intensity at some spot and you don't get double the output, <clears throat> then that'll cause problems. And then one other thing that I failed to include in this is the size of your, your uh, sensor array, of your image chip. If you don't catch all the diffraction pattern, then you're not getting all the information and you will not be able to get the maximum resolution. Uh, let me see if there are any questions yet on that. No, not yet. Okay. So advantages of tychography. Very high resolution. Uh, you can get the resolution of the best optical microscope you can get your hands on if everything lines up properly. If you, if you have a all the things you want to get a good quality image, you'll get resolution that is probably better than you can get with any other optical microscope. Um, the reason is what you're doing is you're building what amounts to a synthet synthetic aperture that can be as big as you want it to be. So it's like having, well, it's like having a lens that's beyond physical possibility. Uh, you do have the possibility of 3D imaging, but it takes a lot longer because you need to do the scan many times at many different angles. 
Uh, another advantage is it's really simple. The, it works for x-rays, it works for neutrons, it works for electrons, it works for uh, microwaves, it works for light. It, it's terahertz, works with terahertz. Um, all you have is an object and a source of your, of your radiation and a scan and an XY transport and then something that'll detect the spatial distribution down at the in the diffraction pattern. Okay, uh, Dick has asked, how do you confine the laser beam to a spot? Doesn't this cause that spot to be a diffraction pattern? <laughs> that that's a pretty good question, actually. Any place in a laser beam, anywhere in the laser beam, is a diffraction pattern. It just is. It's it's the way it goes. But but when you focus it to a spot, it's a very simple diffraction pattern. So the way you would confine it to a spot is you take the laser beam first. You clean it up with a pinhole spatial filter. Uh, then you send it through a circular aperture or square aperture or whatever you want. So it's coming through there, uh, we'll say more or less collimated. And then you use a, a pair of lenses, kind of like a telescope, that will then re-image that spot somewhere else, but still leave the beam collimated. And that somewhere else would be on your object. And if you want me to sketch out the the uh, lenses for that, I can I can do that later and email it to you. Oops. Uh, okay, disadvantages of tychography. It's relatively slow, and it's computationally intensive. Now I said earlier that that it's computationally intensive, but not very much so. Um, let's see, I'm gonna show you this. This image right here is, is a before and after picture. Uh, this is the before, this is the object, it's, it's the face of a squirrel, and then the amplitude of a fox image was used as the phase on this. This is all done just numerically. This is not a, not a real test, just a simulation. So the complex object was a, the phase of a fox and the, and the amplitude of a squirrel. You do a Fourier transform of that throw away all the phase information, keep only the intensity information of the Fourier transform, and go through the loop many times, and this is what you get back out. And it's pretty much indistinguishable. Now, you'll notice here that this is broken into a bunch of spots. This was actually a, a tychography simulation. Uh, in a three by three array of, of spot locations. And this was done <clears throat> by a friend of mine within hours of when I suggested, suggested that he give it a try. He, he understood immediately the math involved, which is surprisingly simple. You can do it in MATLAB without any trouble. Um, Okay, so that is my, my quick and simple and informal presentation of what tychography is. So are there any questions? Okay, I, I missed those. Let me stretch that out and see what we got. Okay, binary masks. How do you know what? Okay. 
Fourier image is okay. The first an earlier question Dick asked is so the Fourier image is of the projection. Um, okay, we really have two things. We have the object and the light hitting it. And so the the uh, light distribution right at the surface of the object is really the product of the phase and amplitude of the incoming laser beam by the phase and amplitude function of the object itself. It's the product of those two, point by point. As the light field propagates through space to the image sensor, uh, it rearranges itself. And that rearrangement is described by the Fourier transform. Uh, for it to actually be accu accurately described by the Fourier transform, it has to travel a relatively long distance, meaning, you know, a few centimeters or something like that. Let's see what else we got. Assuming a 2D object, boy, I missed all these questions. Okay. Oops, here we go. Here's something. Okay, that's a good one. Effective incoherence in the illuminating beam. Oddly enough, this can actually be done with incoherent light. It just isn't as good. Uh, a fellow by the name of, what's his name, Ori Katz, an Israeli researcher, uh, wrote a very short, simple paper that is what really caught my interest in this. He showed that you could take a piece of shower glass that's intended to let light through but be effectively opaque and uh, take a photo of something on the other side of that shower glass and then unscramble the photo. Um, I sort of doubted it, but, and I wasn't able to make his algorithm work, but I made my algorithm work on it. So uh, you can do that. That's totally incoherent. But if you want to get down to half wavelength resolution, you need coherence. Airy disk, um, you're talking about around the laser beam at in the illumination spot. Uh, Dick, your mic is on, so you can just talk. So you can just talk. Yes, uh, yes, I'm talking about the, 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 the illumination spot. Do you use a microscope objective if you're dealing with something small? Uh, probably, yeah. Spot? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. And is that then an airy disk? I'm going to turn your mic off for a moment. Turn your mic off. Uh, yes, it's a, it's an, it would be an airy disk, of course, at the focus. Um, but actually, it doesn't matter. Uh, it turns out that in this math, you solve for the phase of what comes out of the object. And you can kind of ignore what what's going into the object because that's part of what's coming out of the object. You still don't know uh, what the phase or even the intensity distribution in the illuminating beam is, but it all kind of works out. Uh, if you happen to know the exact size and shape and, and intensity distribution, et cetera, of the incoming laser beam, you can get to a good solution quicker. But, but you can still solve for it. I'm going to, I'm going to turn your mic back on. Okay. Your mic is back on. Uh, how many uh, iterations to uh, convergence? Um, it depends, 
It depends on the specific algorithm you're using. It depends on the specific algorithm you're using. Uh, and it depends how you count your your iterations, but uh, two or three thousand iterations is not unusual. Uh, in the algorithm I ended up developing, uh, it's more like 40 or 50. In terms of total time, it depends how big and complicated your object is, but for something like that, the squirrel fox thing, it'd just be a few minutes. Okay, I will go on down here. I'm going to, Dick, I'm going to leave your microphone off so we don't get that echo. Just get my attention if you want it back on. Okay, what's the relationship of the spot diameter to camera pixel width? Um, there's, there is a relationship, but it's kind of distant because other things fold in. Uh, um, the smaller the spot diameter, the bigger your your speckle pattern is going to be in your in your diffraction pattern. And the bigger the speckle pattern is, uh, the fewer pixels you need to capture it. The the bigger the the speckles are in your diffraction pattern then the fewer the pixels you need to capture it. Um, that's beyond that it, it gets more complicated but uh, the fact of the matter is the more pixels you have the, the better it's going to be. Okay, Susan asks, do you have MATLAB code that does this? Um, I do, and I would be happy to, to provide it. Uh, it'll only be useful, though, if I uh, can sort of tune it so it, it suits what you want to do with it, because I didn't, I didn't design it to be easy for people to use. Uh, what frequencies of lasers do you use? Actually, uh, I like visible lasers because I know where the beam's going, but but uh, the technique works with with anything from terahertz to X-rays. As long as you've got a detector uh, with lots of pixels in it, or you can even have a single pixel detector and scan that through the diffraction pattern. Um, I normally will use a green laser though because there's lots of power and long coherence length, etc. and they're not expensive. Could you use near IR? Yes. 40,000 40, watts. This is Dick's question. I'm going to turn your microphone back on. Okay, Dick, 40,000 watts. Oops, I lost you. 40 yep. iterations yep. with the way you run it or 40,000 iterations? Oh, you mean when I when I said 40, 50? When I said 40, 50? Yeah, when you said 40, did you mean 40 or 40,000? No, four zero. Four zero. Oh, you Very four fast. Zero. Okay. Very fast. Oh, okay. Excellent. Unmuted. Okay, Tom says, what is it converging to? Uh, what does it converge to? Okay, uh, let me show the image again, because I think you came in kind of late, Tom. So, uh, where is it? Shrink that. Okay, this is where we started. We've got an, an object, which would be a sample under a microscope. We illuminate it with a laser beam and we get this big diffraction pattern. Uh, that's the basic 
thing we're we're dealing with and the object the objective is to take this diffraction pattern and from that get the object and then what tychography is is that generalized to the case where you scan the object by putting the spot the laser spot in many different places on that object so you have a whole lot of different diffraction patterns and then what you want to do from all those diffraction patterns is reconstruct that object so uh, I guess the answer is it converges to the phase and and amplitude of the light just as it exits the object is that a is that a good answer Tom yeah I think uh, I don't know if you can hear me but uh, I, yeah I do. yeah it looks like that, that says a lot thanks for the picture yeah the picture says a lot yeah and and if everything is done right you can end up with resolution down to close to a half wavelength it's it's super good and in principle if you because you're illuminating it monochromatically uh, it's it should be possible to measure the absorption spectrum at every point in the object down to that kind of resolution and I haven't heard of anyone doing that but it would be really interesting thing for someone to do let's see if there are any other questions so the object could be incomplete um, this is from Tom what do you mean by that Tom well the actually the picture I'm looking at here it looks like there's a partial image and you want to actually uh, reconstruct it as a full image is that would that be safe to say or is that what you mm -hmm. No, nope. the, the, okay. <laughs> I grabbed I grabbed this picture off the off uh, the internet because <clears throat> I didn't have much time to prepare for this. But we can presume that that this this thing here is a microscope slide with with something on it, and we know roughly where the something is, so we we scan across that. So we do need to cover the whole thing with the laser beam. Okay, so this is a way of getting just real good resolution without uh, super fancy equipment, you know. Yeah, without any downstream lenses. Okay. You don't need a microscope. All you need is a is um, the sensor array out of out of a camera. Okay, so that's that's basically all the stuff I have to say about tychography uh, if anyone's got any questions yeah. email oh, yes. <laughs> uh, hold on hold on okay I was I was look Steve we reached the point where I think we may understand it so now the question is next how do you use it uh, okay so you've got the Fourier transform including amplitudes for each spot in the two-dimensional projection correct um what um the basic data gathering the basic data gathering i'm going to turn off your echo the basic data gathering uh when that's done you've obtained the intensities at every point uh in the diffraction pattern you've, you've obtained the the let me start over again you've obtained the absolute value of the Fourier transform of each of those spots in the object that's that's what you've got after you've gone through the the uh, all the iterations what you'll have is an image of the object plus some additional information having to do with what the object does to the phase of the light going through it. Okay, I've just turned oh. your microphone back on. Okay, I'm, I'm not interested in the image. I want to know when you're done, do you have the Fourier transform 
including both the amplitude and phase components of the whole image. Yes. So, okay. you've, so you've got more information. Got more information. Right. So, okay. So how do you put together the individual spot images, or no, the, the spot Fourier transforms, the full Fourier transforms of the spots after the iterations you've got now, you have the uh, amplitude and phase components of the individual spots. How do you put those together to get the, uh, the uh, uh, amplitude and phase of the whole image? Okay. Um... Let me dig out another another picture I've got here, uh, right here. Okay, here's here's the object that we want to build an image of. And we can take, we scan it with our laser beam like so. Uh, now, in, in the algorithm, what we do is first, we sort of, we just do a few iterations of the algorithm on this first spot. Then we do a few on this spot, but when we start this second spot, we take the results from that first spot in this overlapped area. Let me enlarge that a bit. Maybe that'll be more visible. Uh, we take the, the, uh, this overlapped area right here, and we include that in the initial guess for what this next spot is. Then we run this through a few iterations. What that does is it gives us a further refinement of what's in the overlapped area, and then it gives us a first guess at what's in this next overlapped area. So after we've gone through all this stuff, we've got uh, a somewhat refined, I mean, it might not even be recognizable, but a somewhat refined first guess at everything in here. Uh, we, we have a first version of the object because we're just updating. Every time we do one of these spots, we're updating the region of the overlap. So when we're all done running through all this stuff, uh, uh, we have an X, Y map of the phase and amplitude. The phase and amplitude. And amplitude. Uh, yes. That's what I'm having trouble understanding. Yes. Uh, the, at an individual spot, you get phase and amplitude information for that spot. Okay? Now, what I need is not this picture, but an array of, phase, of Fourier transforms one for each spot, and then I need to see how those are combined to make one Fourier transform for the whole image. That's what I'm not. You are muted. Uh, there may be some confusion about the meaning of Fourier transform in this context. The diffraction pattern is the Fourier transform for a spot. It is the Fourier transform. Not as recorded by the camera because it only gets amplitudes. That's correct. But the, the diffraction pattern itself, the light field that is the diffraction pattern, that is the Fourier transform of that spot, that portion of, of the object. So when we invert that, what we get is an inverse Fourier transform, but what we get is a phase and amplitude distribution across that spot. 
and all those spots are overlapping and and what we've done is we've done is each each uh, each subsequent spot includes a portion of the phase and amplitude uh, map of the previous spot refines that a little bit and in the process at each point it's saying I'm mean, at each step it's assigning a phase and amplitude to an XY position in the whole image uh, first within the spot and then within the next spot which overlaps in here so as we're going across the image we just keep building a phase and amplitude map point by point across the whole image okay so that becomes then the phase and amplitude of the whole image and the whole object yeah and the whole object yeah and the whole object so if you were then to do an inverse Fourier transform that's when of the whole thing that's when you get your back back your picture no no uh the picture i have the picture i have drawn right here the picture i've got drawn right here uh, let me shrink it back down. This is the res result of going from all the diffraction patterns back to the object. So this represents two things, really. One is where we're illuminating the object in a whole series of spots. Uh, and then off screen here someplace, we have all these diffraction patterns. Every diffraction pattern that we get corresponds to one of these spots. And that spot, after we've gone back to the spot, the spot represents just a peephole looking at the object at that point, and it contains the phase and amplitude information in that region of the object. Um, let me go on to Tom's question for a second. Uh, is this sort of like a common filter where you combine many measurements to produce a good estimate? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's analogous to that. Um, Bradley, you had asked me if I would, if I would do a, brief talk about that other paper. Do you still want me to do that or is it getting too late? Okay, are we done with this for the time being? Feel free to, to uh, uh, send Steve, me questions and I'll try to answer them. Try to answer. Yeah. Steve, I'm missing, yes. I'm missing one essential step. And that is, where is the Fourier transform of the whole two-dimensional object? Ah, okay, we never make it, we never build it. All we have is the Fourier transforms of, of the individual pieces of the object. But if you wanted the Fourier transform of the whole object, if you wanted that, uh, we could construct it. We have enough information. And the way to do that, the easiest way to do that, would be to take the whole object that we've recreated and take its Fourier transform. And what that would give us then uh, is, is the Fourier transform of the whole object. And if we looked at its intensity, it would show us what would happen if we illuminated the whole object with a laser beam. Okay, so here's here's my point. I'm, I'm not asking this just to get it. I know. <laughs> Are you familiar with you're familiar with projection theorem? Familiar with what? Familiar with what? What's called the projection theorem for Fourier space. Uh yeah. Uh yeah. Okay, now in the projection theorem, if the object is three dimensional, then at each angle, you're getting a section of the three-dimensional Fourier transform of the whole object. Right. Okay. Right. So, so 
the reason I want the three-dimensional Fourier transform of the projection is to then put them in three-dimensional Fourier space, interpolate and produce a 3D Fourier representation of the object, and then back transform that to get the full 3D object. Okay, I understand what you're looking for. The way to do that, uh, I don't have a, a suitable drawing in front of me, but but the the assumption in the uh, oops just a minute I just moved something uh, come back here and drag this back what did I do okay let's just move this back up here where we can see it. Uh, the assumption here in this drawing is that the laser beam is normal to the surface of of the screen here. To get to be able to use the projection theorem and thereby have the information you need to recreate a three-dimensional image of the entire object, you would need to do this many times where the laser beam is coming in from different angles. Uh, that are not perpendicular to the screen here. Each one of, and, and that would produce a whole lot of different diffraction patterns uh, than, than we had on our first scan. Does that help any? Uh, you, you just need a whole lot of diffraction patterns to build the 3D for a, for a transform that you can then invert to make your object. But the, I'm assuming, well, maybe the optics is screwing this up, but I'm assuming that the laser beam is parallel, is always parallel before it hits the object. Is that wrong? Uh, in the assumption is normally that, that the laser beam is the same, doesn't change as you're scanning the object. So you can, you can, scan the object with the laser beam at one angle and then you tilt the laser beam and then you scan it again and then you tilt it again you scan it again or alternatively you can always keep the laser beam the same and you can tilt the object or rotate the object rotate yes yes you do a full rotation so you would get it from many different angles exactly okay exactly Right. Okay. And because it because the laser beam is always parallel to itself as it scans, then you are getting a proper projection image. Yes. And you're getting a parallel yes. projection image. Okay. Even though it's the diffraction pattern you're recording rather than the image, but it's parallel. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. So then this this should work. Now, Susan, uh, uh, we've got to, we would like to do this with axolotl embryos. And the problem we have is the axolotl embryos are uh, visually translucent with highly light scattering uh, uh, yolk particles in them. So what we need to do is find a wavelength that has the scattering minimized. Okay. And I'm not sure experimentally how to do that. Two millimeters. Okay. Uh, now, the the second paper that Bradley asked me to talk about may actually be usable for your axolotl embryos. So, if it's okay, I'll go to that one now. All right. 
Okay. Oops, what's this? Hang on. Don't How about want, a, a two, don't minute, want. two minute break? Okay. Okay. Looks like Bradley has Looks like taken a break too. Bradley is taking a break too. Okay. I, I read okay. somewhere on the internet. Somewhere on the internet. Get off for a second. Uh, I read somewhere on the internet that that's only supposed to take 20 seconds, regardless of what kind of animal you are. That <laughs> that two minute break. Okay, uh, so here's here's the next thing. Um, Dick, I've turned your microphone back on, but if you could mute it when you're not using it, I think. Okay, good. So, um, is everybody acquainted with the term photoacoustics? Let me. Dick says no, and. Okay, uh, <clears throat> here's the general idea. Um, if you shoot a laser beam or any kind of light into some tissue or into a, a solution or into anything that the light will penetrate into, uh, it will heat wherever it hits. And sometimes the amount of heat is very small. But when something's heated, it expands. So if you imagine that you're focusing the light into one little point somewhere inside a piece of tissue and you just send a pulse of light to that one point, that one point is going to emit a sound wave because it expands briefly when the light hits it. Uh, that's what photoacoustics is about. One way or another, you illuminate a sample and then you've got microphones sitting on the sides to pick up any sound waves that are emitted. Now, there's all kinds of information you can get from that, uh, which I'll go into later. But <clears throat> for now, let me just show you some pictures here. Uh, I think this is the first one. Nope, that's not a picture. Hang on. Shrink that, shrink that. Uh, maybe it's this one. Yes, here we go. All right, enlarge this. So imagine that we have some tissue. That's this pinkish stuff. And we surround that with acoustic detectors, just little microphones. And we have a source of sound at some place inside the tissue. All these detectors around here uh, are exquisitely good at detecting when a signal arrives. 
So by comparing when the signal arrives to all these different places, we can localize, we can determine with great precision down on the order of a half wavelength of the sound, we can determine where that source is. Um, that's what ultrasound's all about, uh, that and variations on it. Now, normally what happens is there will be an emitter array that sends a bunch of sound into the tissue and then a bunch of detectors that will pick up what comes out of it. And they do a lot of computation and come up with an image of the scattering of sound inside the tissue. But it doesn't have to work that way. You can actually, if you have a sound source right in the middle, uh, let's imagine you had a little magnetic particle and you could just twitch that particle. That would launch a sound wave and you could tell exactly where that particle was. And on the way, in the process, you'd also learn some things about the tissue, uh, how the tissue affects the sound wave going through it in each direction. So that's acoustic imaging. Now it's photoacoustic imaging if you create that sound source using light. Now, if anyone's making comments, I can't see them yet, so let me, okay, see if anything else got said. Okay, no one's asked any questions. So now we'll go to the next thing. which is the way this photoacoustic imaging works. You have a laser pulse that illuminates the volume of your tissue diffusely. Uh, because like your, your uh, axolotl embryo, most tissues scatter light pretty crazily. They don't scatter sound quite so much, but they scatter light. So you, you illuminate the whole volume of the tissue with a pulse of light. Now, for all practical purposes, the light arrives everywhere in that volume at the same instant. As far as the sound is concerned, it's all one instant because the sound frequencies are much, much, much slower than the light frequencies. And much the period of a sound wave, even an ultrasound wave, uh, is vastly longer than the duration of a typical laser pulse, which laser pulse might be on the order of a few nanoseconds for kind of a long pulse, but a typical ultrasound frequency is on, on the order of microseconds. So we're, we're talking about uh, the period of the sound wave being on the order of a thousand times longer than the than the typical laser pulse. So we so in essence we've got every point in that tissue instantaneously illuminated by light. Some of the light gets absorbed. And by the way, it doesn't matter that the light is diffused. It gets in there. So everything's lit up. Everything is momentarily heated by a quite a small amount by the light. So every point in that tissue emits a sound wave in proportion to how much light it absorbed. The microwave, the, sorry, the microphones that are surrounding this pick up the sound wave and each microphone hears it a little bit differently because it's traveled a different distance from every point in the tissue. And uh, I don't know the math for doing this, but it's going to be analogous to the math that we just described in the tychography. You're dealing with Fourier transforms and, and uh, basically trying to find the best model of what's inside that tissue to give you a prediction of what the acoustic detectors will see that matches up with, with what they actually did see. So uh, there's some really neat, oh yeah, one more thing. The, the resolution that can be obtained here is the, is the ultrasound resolution. So it's not unusual for, for uh, 
ultrasound waves to have something on the order of, of uh, a few microns of length, the, the wavelength, and that's the kind of resolution that you can get uh, using this ultrasound imaging. Uh, okay, so let me show you some videos that, that these guys provided. I think this will work. I haven't tried this yet, but here we go. There may be some delays. Okay, here's, here's uh, what they got of a whole mouse. Now, there's a, a lot of math that goes into this because this is tomography, but, but it's entirely just illuminating this mouse with a series of light pulses while he's still alive, catching the ultrasound images as they come through. And our resolution there is down on the order of a fraction of a millimeter. Okay, now <clears throat> I must say I'm not an expert on this stuff. Uh, Bradley asked me to, to do what I could to explain what's going on, uh, what's described in this paper. So that's what I'm doing here. But uh, the let's see if it says anything useful down here. Here's the setup in this case. They're using a uh, infrared laser. They're diffusing the light out. It's already going to get diffused by the mouse, but they're diffusing it some more before it gets to him. Uh, in this case over here, they're hitting it with two different. Let's see, is that right? No, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not sure what they're doing here, but, but, uh, it's important to, to note that that uh, what you're looking at, what you see, depends on the wavelength of light that you use, because different tissues will absorb, and different components of different tissues will absorb uh, different frequencies of light, different wavelengths of light, more efficiently. So, so you're kind of doing absorption spectroscopy in 3D uh, of whatever you're looking at. That, again, like I said, for tychography, just seems like it could be really, really useful. Now, this won't give you the same resolution that you can get using tychography, but I think it's a whole lot faster. And uh, uh, more complicated, I suppose, but but it looks useful to me. I see some questions here that people asked. Uh, Dick says, how small can the microphones be? Uh, good question. I don't know. <laughs> it must be a good one, because I don't know. Uh, what is the temperature rise? It's, I don't know. I think there might be some discussion of that in some of these papers, but I believe it's extremely small. It doesn't take much to launch a detectable sound wave. They should try 1,300 nanometers. What's special about 1,300 nanometers? Your microphone's not on. Uh, yeah. Water Sorry, Susan, what'd you say? Less water absorption. Oh. So water absorbs 1,300 nanometers real efficiently? I'm working 
working with someone who's doing optical figure tomography at 1310 nanometers, and he says it's a sweet spot. So the um, skin, looking at eyes, skin, and colon with that frequency because it's you can see further into the tissue with it. It doesn't absorb the water readily. Oh, or water that isn't doesn't absorb the that frequency as well. At least from the graph I saw. Okay. Well, I don't know. All right. Um. Any any wavelength that you that for which there is a suitable light source will work for something like this, as long as you have enough power. Uh, another thing I'd like to mention about photoacoustics: when I first encountered photoacoustics was uh, close to 20 years ago. Uh, someone who had a a laboratory right next to ours was doing photoacoustics basically measuring the properties of stuff that was dissolved in liquid samples. And uh, it turns out that if you shoot a pulse of light into, uh, let's see, my webcam's turned off, isn't it? I don't know how that happened. There we go. Uh, if you shoot a pulse of light uh, into a sample in the form of a very thin sheet, of light, then it'll launch sound waves that come out like so. And if you if you monitor those sound waves, you'll find that you'll get an initial pulse just from the initial heating, but then you get some more pulses that follow that uh, result from the fact that molecules will absorb some of the light and then they'll relax and then they might relax some more and relax some more. And every time they do that, they emit another sound pulse. So you can learn something about the electronic structure of what's in the liquid sample by the kind of sound that comes out when you hit it with a pulse. Uh, I haven't seen anything in these papers talking about using that, that phenomenon. <clears throat> um, I've got a blacksmithing student showing up in about 15 minutes. So, uh, if you're interested, there's one more thing I'd like to show you before I have to quit. Uh, uh, let's see if I can find it. Let's see, where did I put it? I think it was in here. It was, uh, here we go. Okay, this is something that, this is a free invention I'm, I'm handing out to the world. <laughs> uh, starting right here. So <clears throat> it turns out that you can focus ultrasound to a really small point inside a tissue. Uh, you can detect the location of that, that focused spot uh, if you can focus light onto that spot, then that spot will modulate the light. So, so it turns out that using some of the methods from, from that I described in tychography, that phase ret retrieval stuff, you can, now here I'm gonna wave my hands in front of the camera. Uh, you can send light in, into a diffusing structure and it goes everywhere. But if you can tell how much light is reaching a certain point, you can modify the shape of the wave front as it comes in and keep adjusting that until you get more and more light focused to that one point. And you can end up getting a really good focus. Basically, you come in with a scrambled light beam that is then unscrambled by the diffu diffusive properties of the medium it's passing through. Um, so you can focus a, a light beam to a point through a diffusing tissue. Um, this has been demonstrated for imaging purposes, but the thing is that if you, once you know the shape 
of the wavefront, you need to focus the light down to a point. You can then hit hit that with a just use a much more powerful pulse with the same wavefront shape, and all of that or a large fraction of that light will focus down to that one point in the pulse, which means you should be able to do laser surgery. You come in, come in here and you just pick this one spot and you want to blow that up. You want to heat it, you want to break some molecular bonds or, or whatever. But all this stuff on the outside is diffusive, doesn't matter. As long as you've got uh, a suitable ultrasound system and a wavefront uh, modulator and the right algorithms, it ought to be possible to do laser surgery on the scale of a few microns inside diffusive tissue. Okay, that, that was what I wanted to say. And yes, it's called laser ablation, uh, but if you wanted to ablate one neuron inside a living mouse's brain, this would be the way to do it without having to stick any probes into the brain. My pleasure. <laughs> I'm I'm never going to do anything with this idea I just described. So anyone who wants to play with it, it's yours. So, all right. Uh, thank you. I enjoyed this.